This video lecture is going to cover chemical reactions. Now, broadly speaking, chemical reactions are making and breaking bonds. And some chemical reactions release energy, those are exergonic, and others require energy, and those would be endergonic. So the question comes, why in biology do we care about energy in chemical reactions? Well, first, we know that life has to have energy to exist. It uses energy to create order and maintain homeostasis. So all life acquires energy from its environment. So if you're an autotroph, auto means self and troph means feeding, you're getting your energy from sunlight and you're storing it as some type of organic molecule. On the other hand, if you're a heterotroph like this uh, robber fly eating this other bee, well, you get your energy from the foods that you eat. Regardless of whether or not you're a heterotroph or an autotroph, you rely on chemical reactions to use energy to do work. So you either are using chemical reactions to extract energy from your environment, or you're using chemical reactions to build things to create order and maintain homeostasis. So what exactly is a chemical reaction? Well, let's just begin with something very simple. Fire is an example of a chemical reaction, and it's a chemical reaction that releases energy. Not all chemical reactions release a lot of energy. Some, in fact, actually require more energy than it takes to get them started. Here's an example of a chemical reaction, a very important one. You take some glucose, we're gonna react that with oxygen, and we're gonna get some carbon dioxide, some water, and this reaction is gonna release energy. You may have recognized this chemical equation. It's the overall equation for cellular respiration. It's incredibly important because this is how we extract energy from our environment. On the left side, we have the reactants, glucose and oxygen, and on the right side, we have the products, carbon dioxide and water, and it also released some energy as well. An important point here to make is that the reactants and the products are all different molecules. So in your reactants, you've got glucose and oxygen. Then on your products, you have carbon dioxide and water. These are the four different molecules. Two of them are reactants and two of them are the products. Cellular respiration is a chemical reaction. So what's going on here is that the bonds that are holding the elements together in the different molecules, those bonds are being broken and the molecules are being shuffled around to form new molecules. But what's very important are the elements. The elements are the same on both sides. So I've got six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and 18 oxygens. That's the total amount of elements and atoms I have as reactants. And then on the products, I have the exact same. Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and 18 oxygens. And in fact, in any chemical reaction, the number of elements has to be the same in both the reactants and the products. So in these reactions, we're just breaking bonds and forming new ones to create new molecules. Taking a closer look, here is the linear form for glucose. And glucose contains six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens, and they are held together by covalent bonds. Now those OH groups, we're getting a little lazy right there, but the oxygen is also covalently bonded to the hydrogen. And remember, that is not a hydrogen bond, that is a covalent bond. And of course, the other molecules in cellular respiration, including oxygen, is also made up of just two oxygen atoms, and carbon dioxide has one carbon and two oxygens, and water is, of course, one oxygen and two hydrogens. As a reminder, Glucose can come in either the linear structure, as we see on the left. It can also be seen as the ring structure on the right. Either way, they're still held together by covalent bonds, and the carbons are all the same. So, for instance, that one that just highlighted there, that's carbon number three, and on the linear structure, there would be carbon number three as well. Fire is an example of a chemical reaction that releases energy. Wood is mostly made up of cellulose, which is a polymer of glucose. We react that with the oxygen in the atmosphere, and that, of course, gives us our products, which are carbon dioxide, water, along with a few other things as well. Now, this is an extragonic reaction that also releases energy. So in some ways, it's also an endothermic reaction because of some of that energy is lost as heat to the environment. Why is fire, or cellular respiration, an extragonic reaction? That is a reaction that releases energy. Well, the answer lies in the fact that 
the bonds of the products are stronger than the bonds of the reactants. So those covalent bonds holding together carbon dioxide and water are much stronger than the covalent bonds holding together glucose molecules and oxygen. And that once again has to go with the electronegativity of the elements. When you look at the reactants of glucose, the first thing you notice, there's a lot of carbon covalently bonded to other carbon and covalently bonded to hydrogen. These form nonpolar covalent bonds and they have more potential energy because the electrons are shared equally between these elements. However, when we look at the products, carbon dioxide and water, you notice there's all these polar covalent bonds. Oxygen is way more electronegative than either carbon or hydrogen. So the oxygen is holding on to those electrons very tightly. As a result, carbon dioxide and water have less potential energy. And those bonds are very strong because oxygen doesn't like to give up its electrons. We also know from the first law of thermodynamics that energy is conserved. Now what that means is the potential energy in our reactants, both glucose and oxygen, has got to equal the potential energy in the products plus the energy released to the environment. We're not gaining or losing any energy here. And we know that these products, carbon dioxide and water, contain less potential energy because the oxygen is holding onto these electrons very tightly and those bonds just don't have as much energy as you would find in the nonpolar covalent bonds of your glucose molecule. Here's a graph showing the change in energy in our exergonic reaction. Let's look at cellular respiration. We have glucose and oxygen are the reactants, and when they form the new products of carbon dioxide and water, energy is released. And that energy release is the difference in the potential energy between the reactants and the products. Now you may notice this little hump right there. That is the activation energy. And the activation energy is the amount of energy required to break the bonds of glucose and oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. We do not count that hump as the activation energy for the total energy release. Only the difference between the reactants and the products. To get a chemical reaction started, you need to have an input of energy. That's the activation energy. And the reason why you need energy to get a chemical reaction started is because it takes energy to break a chemical bond. And then, once you get those chemical bonds broken, they're going to form new ones. Extragonic reactions like fire and cellular respiration are considered to be spontaneous. Here's why. It takes energy to break a bond. That's your activation energy for the reaction. However, when the new bonds of the products are formed, that's your carbon dioxide and water, those products don't have a lot of energy. So, we have to have our balance of energy, so when those bonds are being formed, energy is released. So anytime you have a chemical reaction, energy is released when bonds are formed. Now, the energy released from the formation of the products is enough energy to break the bonds of the reactants. So therefore, every time products are being formed, that's releasing enough energy to burn, to break the bonds of the reactants, and this reaction will continue until you've used up all your reactants. That's what it means to be a spontaneous reaction. And now for some good news about spontaneous combustion. Unlike Kenny here on South Park, you don't have to worry about it. You may have seen pictures on the internet, you may have read stories about people that spontaneously combust, but I promise you it cannot happen without an energy source. You have to have some ignition source for spontaneous combustion to occur. Yes, I know you've seen something on the internet. Ignore it. They are, it's either a hoax or they never found the ignition source. And here's why. You know now that it takes an input of energy and a lot of energy to start a chemical reaction. And if spontaneous combustion was possible, then the paper on your desk would spontaneously combust randomly, the books on your shelves, the trees in a forest, the gasoline in your gas tank. But they don't do that. And the reason why is it takes an input of energy to break chemical bonds. And I'm sorry, the amount of heat you generate, 100 degrees even during a bad fever, is nowhere close to the amount of energy required to break the bonds that hold your body together. The opposite of an exergonic reaction would be an endergonic reaction. So for example, if the reactants of carbon dioxide and water plus some energy, we're going to get carbohydrates like glucose and oxygen, and these would be the products. 
This is an example of an endergonic reaction, a very important one called photosynthesis. The reason why endergonic reactions require an input of energy is because the reactants, carbon dioxide and water, they contain less potential energy than the products of glucose and oxygen. And this reaction is not spontaneous. Once you quit adding an ener an energy, it stops. You can have carbon dioxide and water mixed together in a jar from here till the end of time, and you will never get a glucose molecule unless you add a lot of energy. And in this case, it takes way more energy to break those covalent bonds holding carbon dioxide and water together than the energy released when the products are formed. This is why this is an endergonic reaction. And here's our graph showing the amount of energy required for an endergonic reaction. Our reactants, carbon dioxide and water, have much stronger bonds than the products of glucose and oxygen. So to make this reaction happen, it takes a large input of energy to break the bonds of carbon dioxide and water, and a lot less energy is produced or released when glucose and oxygen are formed. I always like to take a moment and point out the importance of photosynthesis. Because it takes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and stores it as a carbohydrate, it makes carbon available to you and every other living organism on this planet, basically, with the exception of a few things in thermal vents. And the byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen, which makes multicellular life possible because it led to the evolution of eukaryotes. And of course, our planet has this beautiful bluish color because of all the oxygen in the atmosphere, along with the nitrogen and the oxygen also, it oxidized all of the iron and other metals in the water, creating banded iron formations, but it really cleaned out the water and our planet has this beautiful bluish color today. And lastly, just to sum it up, chemical reactions is about making and breaking bonds. Some chemical reactions release energy, those are exergonic, and some require energy, those are endergonic. This assassin bug is eating the small beetle, just literally drinking the juices right out of it. But it's acquiring nutrients and energy. So through exergonic reactions, it will break down organic molecules. Those reactions release energy that our metabolism will then use to power or supply the energy required for endergonic reactions, which are anabolic reactions which build up larger molecules and help us create order and maintain homeostasis.